Having a prepared investing plan for 2024 is going to involve factoring in elevated interest rates, an election year, optimizing the right accounts that we're investing into, as well as making sure that our asset allocation is on track. First, let me give you a recap of my investing for 2023, and I will tell you how that's going to change in 2024. Honestly, 2023 was a pretty crazy year. My portfolio started down about 5% overall. I revealed that in the video where I talked about my $500,000 investment portfolio. But 2023 has been a pretty good year. The S&P 500 is up 19 to 20% year to date, and big names like Apple and Google are up almost 50%. Meta is up something like 3x from the beginning of the year, and that's just to name a few stocks. In terms of the things that I focused on this year, I had three different things that I want to focus on. Number one, I wanted to rotate out of some of the growth stocks that I own and into some more ETFs and index funds, just because in a higher interest rate environment, typically money tends to flow out of equities, especially the growth of your stocks, and we're going to talk about that in my 2024 section. Another focus of mine in 2023 was to take my hand off of the trigger. So basically avoid shiny object syndrome and try to avoid just trading individual stocks too often. Another big focus of mine is just to continue to try to average into the market and optimize for endurance rather than chase like a really great six month or one year or three year gain. I think it's more of a sound strategy and it's proven with data to just do better overall for the average investor, which is me. Lastly, in 2023, I still kept a large portion of my portfolio in cash. And we're going to talk about why we want to have so much cash later on in this video. But first, I wanted to discuss the specific things that we should be looking for in 2024 looking ahead. In 2024, it's predicted that the Federal Reserve will keep interest rates elevated at least until mid-2024. That's where the traders right now are currently predicting that the rates start to get cut. So if we assume that the Fed is going to keep interest rates steady at least until mid-2024, we should invest accordingly. Now, here's what Warren Buffett has to say about interest rates in general. It is gravity. I mean, if if you told me interest rates were going to be 15% next year on long bonds, you know, and, uh, I, I, there's a lot of equities I wouldn't want to own now, and I would, I would, I would buy a lot of governments at 15, and I kind of wish I had it in 1982, but I didn't. <laughs> Warren Buffett here states that interest rates are like gravity, so he uses a pretty extreme example in that particular clip where he says interest rates are 15%, but all he's referring to is the fact that when interest rates get close to zero, investors and pension funds, they aren't getting a return in bonds, so all of that money starts to flow towards equities. Quote, historical observation has shown that stock prices and interest rates have an inverse relationship, meaning as interest rates rise, stock prices tend to move lower and vice versa. So in this particular chart, you can see the relationship between the federal funds rate and the S&P 500. And as the interest rate falls, the S&P tends to go up. So when interest rates are low, think of that as low gravity for stock valuations. And when interest rates are high, think of that as high gravity, which means it's gonna keep stock valuations a lot lower. Now I've used this analogy in a past video, but there's a scene in the popular anime series called Dragon Ball Z, where Goku, the main character, is training on a planet with much higher gravity than Earth. Goku, in this case, could be analogous to your stock valuations. So when the gravity is high, the harder it is for valuations to increase, and the opposite would be true too when interest rates are historically low, stock valuations should be pushed up, and Goku, your stock valuations, is able to jump a lot higher. While you shouldn't change your investing strategy solely because of elevated interest rates, it is something to keep in mind, and it's also why in 2023, one of my bigger focuses was to rotate some of my money out of the growth of your stocks and into ETFs and index funds. On the flip side, how However, what we should be looking out for in 2024 is that when interest rates finally do get cut, if they do get cut, that's a good sign for us to start dollar cost averaging into more equities and trying to ride that upside, hopefully. 2024 is also a presidential election year in the United States, and historically, presidential election years are actually pretty good for the stock market. In an article from the previous election in 2020, it says, quote, the S&P has traded positive in each six-month period before a presidential election except in 2008. Of course, 2008 was when the financial crisis happened. So I would argue that that's probably a one-off situation where the market probably didn't perform due to the unforeseen circumstances. Now, historically speaking, here's another quote. Since 1933, the S&P 500 has gained an average of 16.3% in the year before a presidential election and nearly 6.7% on average in the election year. By contrast, the first and second year of a president's term see an average gain of 67 and 5.8% respectively. These are obviously 
past data points, and while they can be looked at, it doesn't mean that this year necessarily will follow that exact pattern 100% of the time. There are also going to be those people out there who think that a strong market is written in the cards because the president or the incumbent president wants to look good for election day. I don't know if that's actually true or not, but that's definitely a theory that I hear that's buzzing around out there. If you'd like to read a more detailed article about the presidential election theory, I'm going to leave a link down below for you guys. That includes studies with many different examples based on what has historically happened when it comes to presidential years. Okay, so let's pivot a little bit. One thing that you should pay attention to in 2024 is the fact that the IRA and as well as the 401k accounts, their contribution limits have increased. The 2023 contribution limit for the IRA is $6,500 for those under the age of 50. Now in 2024, that will actually move up to $7,000 a year. The 401k has also moved up. So this year in 2023, the contribution limit was $22,500. But in 2024, that's going to increase by $500 in total. So that means you can contribute up to $23,000 if you're under the age of 50. An extra $500 a year into an IRA compounded for the next 40 years is going to be the equivalent of an extra $140,000 for your retirement funds. So you want to be making sure you're always contributing to your IRAs if you can, and if you can max them out, then even better. Now, Webull, which is the sponsor of this portion of the video, has actually just come out with their IRAs on their investment platform. Webull is a registered stock investment platform that I've personally been using for over three years now, and as of right now, you can open a traditional or a Roth IRA with them, or you can roll over your existing IRA assets into Webull. They also offer a 5% APY on your uninvested cash through their cash management program service, which is great if you're trying to save up money and get that high yield return and any cash in their cash management is FDIC insured. Webull allows you to buy ETFs and stocks within their IRA accounts and according to research, IRA owners build substantial financial assets and the median financial assets of a household with an IRA account was more than 10 times that of the households that did not have IRAs. In addition, I believe that opening an IRA is one of the best things that you can do in terms of the financial order of operations in order to compound your wealth while ensuring that you're doing so in a tax advantage way. If you're looking to invest for retirement and open an IRA, make sure to check out my Webull link down in the description below to open an account. I'll also leave a QR code right here on the screen right now in case you just want to scan that and do it that way. So thank you to Webull for sponsoring this portion of the video and let's continue on with my 2024 investing plan. In terms of the asset allocation for 2024 and what I'm going to be doing about it in the next year, let's actually talk about it. So for the stock market in particular, I'm actually going to not be doing that much. In the past few years, I've been significantly investing more money than I originally had planned out into the stock market, and those are usually covered across two to three dozen different individual names. Of course, I still have an S&P 500 index fund, VOO, in my holdings, and that's one of my biggest holdings as well. However, I think I've been a little bit too enamored by individual stocks, especially after the COVID flash crash. I just saw the subsequent run-up being like so good that I thought that that was going to last forever. In 2024, I wanna focus on having a a better mentality towards investing, which means that I want to hold at least a majority of my overall portfolio in index funds and ETFs, ideally closer to 60%. The remainder will be for my individual stock positions, any alternative assets, and of course, cash. I want to share with you guys something that I listened to on a podcast recently about what successful investing looks like. So this is from the podcast Diary of a CEO, where he's interviewing the author of the book, Psychology of Money, Morgan Housel. Successful investing is when you lose the password to your investment account. Yes. <laughs> That's exactly it. I don't actually think you said that in there, but that's like, when I lose the password to my investment account, I'm so proud of myself yeah. because it means I haven't checked it in forever. And I think that's really true. I think we should be aiming to forget our investment passwords, provided that we're investing in a diversified mix of investments. If you have an investment in horizon of at least 10, 20, or even 30 years plus, I think the best thing that you can do is just a dollar cost into the average and kind of set it and forget it. And I think what you should really be optimizing for in this case is endurance. Here Here's another great quote on endurance and why you shouldn't try to beat the market from that same podcast. But I think there are really smart people who can do it and people who I know who I could invest with. The reason I don't is not because I don't believe it can be done. It's because the variable that I want to maximize for in my investments is endurance. If I can just earn average returns for an above average period of time, 
it's gonna lead to amount of success that will literally put you in the top 5% of investors. So that's really fascinating, right? Like if we can just get average returns for a really, really long time, we're going to be in the top 5% elite of investors. And we can actually see this play out with data. So one of my favorite articles ever written by any financial author is on the Of Dollars and Data blog. And it's about why you should just keep investing. So looking at the data historically, over any 20 year rolling period, investing in the market tends to return positively. The blog article basically summarizes how stock market returns do every 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30 years in this interactive GIF or GIF, if you will. And you can see that as more time passes, the negative returns slowly disappear, the red dots, and you see more and more positive returns, the green dots. That means if you have a time horizon of 10 years, there might be some scenarios in which you still lose money at that exact 10 year mark. But as your time horizon increases and approaches the 20 year mark or even beyond, there's almost virtually no scenario in which you actually lose money. And this is one of my favorite articles because it illustrates that. And I will leave a link to this exact article down below as well. All right, now the moment you've been waiting for, why do I hold so much cash? So in 2023, I was holding close to 25 or 30% of my portfolio in cash. That's largely unchanged from the year before. And this year I'm probably going to do the same. Now, one reason I still hold a lot of cash today is that oftentimes black swan events are unpredictable. And I'd like to have a certain amount of cash for those certain opportunities that I might be able to come across because I am prepared having a cash stockpile. And as Nassim Taleb actually says, he says, quote, invest in preparedness, not in prediction. I think it's pretty nice to have an investment strategy that has some cash because that gives you a big enough of a buffer to maintain liquidity. Perhaps you want to start a business one day and have some extra cash on the side, or perhaps one of these black swan events actually happens like the COVID flash crash, the real estate crash of 2008, 9-11 could even be an example of that. And having that cash on the sidelines might be able to grant you some opportunities, especially when it comes to, let's say, real estate prices or asset prices of stocks. In general, something crazy usually happens in the economy once every decade or so. So I just wanna be prepared in case anything like that happens. And also, I also wanna buy a house in 2024 possibly. So I'm gonna talk about that shortly, but uh, for now, let's keep talking about cash. The thing with risk is, is that you generally cannot prepare for these one-off scenarios. The biggest risk out there right now is something that is completely unpredictable that nobody is talking about. And whenever that thing will happen or that event happens, then it's going to crash the market within a day or even a week. Think about if you had 20% or even 30% of your portfolio sitting in cash during the COVID flash crash, you would have been able to scoop up some stocks at a 50%, 60% or 70% discount to what it was trading for before the crash. And subsequently, those would have gone up 2X, 3X or even 5X over the next few years. Now, of course, this strategy is not for everybody. A lot of people don't want to have any cash at all, which I totally understand. You want to invest all the money that you have beside your emergency fund. But this is just something that I personally want to do because in 2024, I might be looking at buying a house, which means I need a big down payment to put down because houses in California, they're just really expensive. However, with interest rates so high and the cost to rent in my city being way cheaper than it is to buy by a lot, I don't think that this is actually gonna happen where I buy a house in 2024, unless interest rates come down and all of a sudden I see a really good deal or a really good opportunity on the market. So in 2024, it's entirely possible that I don't own any property at all, even towards the end of 2024. I still might own some REITs for real estate exposure, as well as a small investment into Fundrise. Now, in terms of cryptocurrency, I don't have an evidence-based strategy for investing in cryptocurrency. That doesn't really exist because it's such a new technology. I've personally always thought that having a small exposure to cryptocurrency was generally fine, nothing more than five to 8% of your total portfolio size. And that's what I'm gonna do in 2024. I'm just going to continue to dollar cost average into Bitcoin as well as Ethereum, just the two biggest cryptocurrencies out there. I think it's a pretty good hedge against world turmoil events. So anything geopolitical that happens, sometimes often what will happen is that investors will flee into Bitcoin because they view it as a safe haven asset. As well as there's a halving in 2024, which basically just means that the amount that you can mine for each block of Bitcoin gets reduced in half. I don't really think that this has too huge of an impact on Bitcoin since the rewards for mining blocks are already so low. However, I think the halving has a huge psychological impact on the entire market. I think people will flee into Bitcoin or just buy more Bitcoin because they say, oh my God, a halving's gonna come. Of course, I could be completely wrong with this take, so just take that with a grain of salt, but I'm still gonna have a really small portion of my portfolio for this Bitcoin investment. Obviously, you can do the same thing or you can do something with alternative assets. The idea here is that just keep it a small percentage of your overall portfolio. All right, this was my investing plan for 2024. Let me know if you had any comments, if you agree with me or 
or you disagree with me, I'd love to hear from you. Make sure to check out my next video on investing right here, and I will see you guys in the next video. Make sure to subscribe. Peace.